Okay, so I've been given the signal to start. How do you like our new logo? Some people say it looks like Google, but <laughs> really we started before Google, so <laughs> it's not fair. Uh, anyway, my name is Jesse Martin. I'm a cloud architect at eBay. And uh, you may have seen uh, recently some uh, press release around what we are doing with Nisira. I don't know if it was because uh, Nisira was just acquired by VMware, there was a big uh, price uh, associated with it, or if it was because everybody was excited about what we are doing. I like to think that it's the second one. So I'm going to talk a bit about what we are doing at eBay, and um, I'll uh, go from uh, quite high level to pretty detailed, because uh, we want to make sure that you understand behind uh, SDN, uh, the hype, what we are really doing, and uh, how we are using SDN to uh, run our developer cloud. So you may wonder what's the, the problem with uh, my title I'm not showing, so I think it's going to be interesting. So eBay is not really a, a public cloud provider, it's not a cloud provider, right? But what we, we have is many different um, businesses, so you know eBay, we have PayPal, and we have a bunch of others. So what it means is that even we, if we are like an internal uh, provider for uh, the eBay Inc. Um, organization, we still have a lot of different businesses that may be potential users of our infrastructure. What it means also is that those users, they may have different environments. For example, at eBay, we have a production environment. We have a production secure environment where we put all the information that identifies users. We have a QA environment. We have a developer environment. And same thing for PayPal. They have production, PCI compliant environment, QA environment, and developer, and it's the same thing for all of them. So even though we don't have a typical public cloud multi-tenant infrastructure, we still have a lot of different environments that we have to support. So traditionally, those environments, they were implemented as physically isolated environments, and this creates a lot of problems, so we'll talk a bit about that. So now, uh, we tried to convert this um, infrastructure and, and we looked at the principles that we wanted to apply on that infrastructure to build it. So the first one was that we were supposed to, we were wanted to be able to deploy any application anywhere. So what it means is that if you have some resource available in one side of the data center, you should be able to use it for front end, even if before only uh, QA was uh, using this uh, side of the data center. The second one is soft cabling. What it means also is that if you want to uh, create a new network, you should not have to go in the data center and wire uh, different uh, machines to different networks. Shared standardized infrastructure. So that's also very important because the fragmentation I was talking before uh, about is also caused by the, a lot of different uh, infrastructure requirements. So we, we used to have more than 100 different server types at eBay and uh, we are starting to reduce that number to few uh, uh, standard servers that users can select from, and this improves a lot our efficiency and ability to automate. The next one is to virtualize everything. A virtualization doesn't only mean running an hypervisor on, on top of a compute server. It means that everything that we do should be abstracted from the application. So for example, it could mean vir network virtualization, storage virtualization, and compute virtualization. The main reason is that we don't want the application to depend on some specific characteristic of the hardware, because if we want to change some uh, hardware uh, model or characteristic, it, the application should not be impacted. And the last one, the most important, is to automate everything. So based on those principles, plus the problem that we had before, what we, we, we had to do is convert all those physical environments into something that can be automated and can be deployed more easily. So we try to first convert all those physical environments in what we call class of service. So a class of service, if you want, is an extension of an SLA or quality of service. It, 
it captures everything that you would implicitly implement in your physical environment. So if you have a QA environment, you are going to have uh, firewall rules, you are going to have access permission uh, definition, you are going to have support uh, specific um, uh, contracts, and so on. So we try to capture that into a logical entity that we call class of service. And then what we do when someone creates a project or an, um, a logical environment, we ask them, is it a production environment? Is it a developer environment? Is it a QA environment? Is it an external environment that is going to be completely uh, externally facing? And uh, based on that, we are controlling how the infrastructure is configured. So what it means is that in a typical cloud provider, you have provider specific rules on what tenants can do. Here, we don't have only one set of rules which applies to all tenants. For depending on the type of projects that the tenant is going to deploy, we reconfigure the provider specific constraints and capabilities to fit that specific class of service. And this allows us, for example, to run together on the same infrastructure, QA, production, developer, and external class of service, and we reconfigure around that logical environment the provider uh, infrastructure so that we can enforce all those restrictions and obligations. So now, uh, the, the other aspect of what we were building is we wanted to have a shared infrastructure, right? So I'm going to go in the details of our network. The main design goal for our network was scale. And we wanted to be as simple as possible so that the network engineering team would not have to build environment-specific networks. So we had this uh, design that's based on the spine and leaf, which is pretty much uh, industry standard for scalable network. It's a level, layer three type of network. So there's routing happening at every level. So the drawing here is a drawing of a, a switch, a label of a, um, an icon of a switch, but it's really a router switch. The size of that infrastructure depends on the number of ports that you have in your spine. So you could have the same switch in your spine that you have in your leaves, which means that you would have 48 ports here and four times 48 would be the maximum number of, um, 48 times 48 would be the maximum number of servers that you can have in your environment in, in that topology, right? So at eBay, we call that um, topology a bubble. Some people might call it a pod, or I don't know what's the official term. Uh, anyway, that's uh, the, the key parameter here is that we want to have line rate or a consistent oversubscription from any node, any two node in that infrastructure. So it's consistent B section bandwidth across and latency across all the nodes in that infrastructure. In order to uh, achieve that, uh, since there's multipass to any node um, in the, the infrastructure, we use OSPF and ECMP for finding the best pass between the two nodes. So now if you look at this infrastructure, you realize, but how do you do isolation? Because you have a large infrastructure which has between um, 5,000 nodes to 10,000 nodes, and you cannot really interpose easily firewalls or control points. So if you look at the options, if you want to do it at layer two, one of the options here is to basically build smaller physical infrastructure. It's not really efficient, efficient because what's happening is that first, you have to build that infrastructure physically for any new project that you want to start or a new class of service. It creates fragmentation because the size of that network is not really flexible. The isol isolation is quite coarse grained because it means that every node within the same network here has the same uh, reachability to any other, right? So you cannot isolate this node from this node but you can isolate this one from this one. So the, the isolation is still coarse grained. The best thing is that there's really physical isolation. You can guarantee that a tenant here cannot see this tenant here. And it's foolproof because there's really no complex technology involved. Maybe the uh, more complex uh, part is the, load by the um, firewall in between the two uh, networks. And uh, this pretty standard uh, design. The other option is VLAN based. So what you do is you still have the same um, 
a frame structure, but instead of being flat L3, you have VLANs and you assign uh, v uh, machines or VMs to a specific VLAN and you can have a firewall between the two VLANs. It's pretty complex because you have to do VLAN assignment for every uh, project or class of service, which means that you are limited in how many network or how many projects you can create on top of that infrastructure. There's uh, one limit which is uh, 4,096 uh, networks or um, VLANs, but th there are some techniques to increase that number. But it's not the, the main issue with that infrastructure. The main issue is that it creates a large layer two fault domain. If you have a problem in one of those um, layer two uh, VLAN, it may impact all your network because of the way uh, STP spanning tree protocols operate. It takes some time to uh, fix issues in STP and you might end up with some outage while the STP protocol recalculate your networks if there's any kind of miscabling happening. The good thing is that it provides layer two isolation, so you could have layer two adjacencies between those nodes. They could use the same IP address space, the same network. And it's somewhat soft cabling because you don't go in the data center and, and pull wires, but you have to reconfigure uh, network switches to add, for example, a new tag or to allow a trunking. So that's layer two. Now the other option is layer three. So you, you go back to my first um, uh, scaled out network where everybody can talk to everybody and you put some layer three filter, either for example on, in the hypervisor using uh, um, security groups, or if you are using a um, uh, hypervisor, you could have, for example, something like vShield that is redirecting the traffic of all the VM to a local firewall, and this local firewall is going to provide this isolation. What we found is that there's, the good thing is that it allows you to have this uh, scalable design that I mentioned before, the spine and leaf, layer three, it's good for user policies because it's uh, pretty lightweight to add, add for example, uh, security uh, groups and uh, rules associated with those security groups. But the problem is that when you are trying to combine those security groups with provider security, it becomes very complex because if you look at the Amazon um, security groups, by default, you can send traffic to everybody. But what if you have a provider rule that says, no, you cannot send traffic to uh, this, um, you cannot reach this part of my network or there's some, some service that you cannot reach. It starts to have, uh, the combina combination of all those rules starts making it very complex. So I think it's good for tenant specific policies which are a specialization or uh, if you want a restriction on top of the provider policies, but I don't think it's very good when you try to combine the two together. The other problem is the management of rules because those rules have to live on every server. And if you mo modify the membership of a destination uh, of your rules, you have to update all the servers. So uh, for example, if uh, you say all my VM can talk to uh, this group of machine, if you add a machine in the target group, you would have to update the rules in every, um, in every server. Even if the, the firewall technology that you are using is doing that for you, at the end of the day, they have to modify the rules in every service that have this rule uh, um, specified. And uh, if you are using L3, you, you may have those machines in complete different subnets. And it's very difficult to do root summarization or aggregation when, you're, when, uh, when you want to rule aggregation or summarization when you want to define those policies. So you might end up with non-efficient policies. So the, the solution that we found was to use virtual layer two networks that as provided by uh, VMware Nisira. So it's kind of like VLANs. You can specify that a VM or a server is part of a network, a virtual network, and you can put a firewall between those networks so you can prevent them from talking to each other if you want, or if they could, uh, you can prevent the routing between those two networks if you want. That ISP space can be completely uh, separate from the ISP space that you have in that layer, which is very useful because when you have 48 server here and you put VMs on top of those servers, the number of IP that you have to provide for each rack is huge. 
So for example, you have a slash 24 for this uh, switch, but then if you have uh, 10 VMs per rack, pair of machine times uh, for, uh, 48, it's already 500 um, IPs, plus you have to have some for uh, the management and so on. So at the end of the day, you end up with uh, wasting a lot of uh, IPs there. So the, the nice thing is that you still have layer two isolation. That guy cannot see this one unless there's a route between the two or there's a, a firewall that allows that. It's compatible with the large scale network design that I mentioned before. Can be fully automated. Everything is configured through APIs. You can still interpose network to have provider specific policies. It can complement layer three isolation because I can still run uh, secure, uh, security rules on my own VM if I want to or in the hypervisor or some other place in the network. It's still compatible with this type of um, isolation. And you can have a large number of networks not limited by, by some tags uh, like the VLAN tags. The negative point is that you have some tunnel overhead to perform that layer two isolation. The traffic is going to be tunneled on the provider network. And the size of those networks uh, is limited because for every uh, layer two network that you are uh, constructing, you have to have tunnels between any two members of that network, which means that it's uh, growing very fast, but it's no different than the type of limit that you have, for example, on a physical switch where you have 48 ports and that's it, right? So that's giving you, there's still some limit, but it, it's uh, still um, something that we can manage. So what is SDN? Um, really, to very simplify at the maximum, and I hope no one is going to blame me for that, if you look at the architecture for a, a, um, a switch or a router, you have some logic that is defining the behavior of the switch engine. So it, that logic co could learn about the network from some protocols. Could be like a Mac learning logic that is going to add some uh, uh, entries in some Mac table in the routing engine. And uh, that's the typical design of a physical switch. Now with SDN, what you do is that you still have this routing or switch engine. It could be a virtual routing or switch engine that runs in an hypervisor, for example. But that switch is kind of a dump. It's a slave to some logic that exists either in an agent on that machine, like the Midopura solution, or it lives in some centralized controller, uh, like what Misira is doing. And that centralized controller, either through protocols, can also learn about the network, but most importantly, it can learn from APIs. So what it means is that instead of trying to discover that a new machine was created on an hypervisor by listening to MAC address, since you know that you created that machine on that hypervisor because you are the one that actually did the instantiation of that VM, you can pre-configure the switch to already know about that VM because you know the MAC address, you know on which hypervisor it was deployed, so you might as well put the entry in the MAC address ahead of time. Like that, you don't have to go through the, the, the discovery phase, which could be based on ARP, for example. And if you want to move that VM from one hypervisor to the other one, since you know that you are moving the VM, you can reconfigure the network at the same time you are moving the VM, which avoids all the problem of uh, IP migration and rediscovering where this uh, IP went and uh, uh, find out how to reach that IP. And it, most uh, network is going to break uh, the um, connectivity anyway because you are changing subnets and things like that. So that's like uh, two minutes. Uh, what is SDN, at least <laughs> as far as I understand it? I'm not going to go into details of what's happened in there or in there because it's too complex. So now the other aspect of uh, SDN is I, I still uh, my opinion. Uh, SDN experts might uh, disagree, but there's kind of at the bottom what we are using at eBay right now, which is just like playing with overlay networks. So what it means is that we are not really reconfiguring complex um, routing or complex uh, behavior of the switches, and we are using virtual switches uh, in hypervisors. The type of protocol that we are missing with is ARP and L2 protocol. In the future, we might do that with L3, but it's still going to be pretty basic. Then you can do more advanced things if you have 
physical servers that are also implementing SDN. And now you have physical servers that can be part of a virtual switch by a membership of ports and uh, other uh, criteria. And at the top of the, the totem is maybe what uh, universities has, are doing right now with SDN or OpenFlow, which is completely implementing new traffic engineering behaviors by reconfiguring network uh, switches so that instead of using, for example, OSPF, ECMP, and having kind of a basic understanding of the network through protocols, you can also configure the behavior of your network based on how you understand it. So for example, if you have multiple paths to a machine, instead of saying all, all the paths are equal and that's a static configuration, you may want to say, okay, this link is saturated, so I'm going now to switch more of the traffic on that other link, or there's some uh, very important traffic on that link, so even if it's uh, more costly to go through this other link, I'm going to do it because there's uh, some important traffic on that link. So you can play with more like the behavior of the switch without relying on complex protocols, which might not know at all what your network is trying to do because they have a kind of a myopic view of the, the computing environment. They only see their peers and what their peers are telling them. So that's the simplified view of SDN. And as I said, for now, we are playing in that uh, level. So not yet uh, ninja or wizard uh, of SDN. So the first implementation that we did is because we wanted to learn also at the same time, it's pretty new technology. We started a year ago, just when uh, Nisira went public with their uh, offerings. So we wanted to try out on a use case that was not like production sensitive. It happens that people uh, that are using them, developers, they are pretty uh, nasty and when it doesn't work, they tell us. So <laughs> even though it's not production, you, you don't want it to be down. So the, the developer cloud, what it is, so it's a logical environment, similar to what I described before, with a class of service that defines what they can do, and we give them a self-service API that they can use to um, get VMs. So we are not using Horizon yet. We have our own uh, layer because we wanted to strip it down to ma the maximum so that they don't break anything. Uh, but the, the idea is that it's an environment that where it, every developer should be able to put their application and collaborate with their friends. Because before what happened is that they would run an application on their desktop or their laptop, but at the end of the day, they close their laptop, their application is not available anymore, or they put it on their desktop and every first day their desktop is rebooting, so they, are, they have big stickers, please do not reboot. So the, um, the, that cloud is giving them a place where they can run their application, and we had an experimentation uh, event that's called um, uh, Skunkworks, where all developers at eBay can uh, showcase a project that they developed in their free time. And uh, we use this environment to give them infrastructure to showcase their projects to VP. And uh, the winner uh, had the, the privilege to have their application uh, on the site live. So it's implemented as a set of layer two networks, and we'll go into details uh, soon. And uh, we are um, grouping those networks, layer two networks, in one big layer three networks. And uh, we have a perimeter firewall that is controlling access to that layer three network and what this layer three network can access outside. We are not exposing yet private networks. So developers are sharing the same network. And this is something that we will do in the future is allow developers to have their own private network and uh, play with more complex uh, infrastructures, topologies, if they want to. And it's isolated for, from our production infrastructure. So the important thing, and uh, we have some uh, representative of our operations in the, in the room. What is pretty scary is that we are giving developer access to our production site, except that they are not really on the production site because they are isolated through layer two. So we are using our shared infrastructure that we are leveraging for production, which is high scale. And on top of it, we, de we developed and deployed this developer cloud. But none of the traffic that the developers can generate is going through that production network because it's routed outside, it's, uh, it's transmitted outside through the um, tunnels to the gateway that bring that traffic outside of the production network. There's some traffic that can reach the production network, but it goes through a firewall first. 
So it's a very uh, interesting proposition for us because now if we want to reclaim the 40 servers that those guys use or 100 or 200 servers that those guys use, we can kick them out and use it for production. We don't have to change anything. We just have to reimage the server and it's done. If we want to use some spare server to give them more capacity because they have a big project, they want to test some uh, algorithm on 150 servers, we can also do that. We just take temporarily some production servers, we attach them to that network, and they can uh, um, experiment with that infrastructure. So very important to enable a, a scale out test, and we have already have some projects that requested like 16 VM to do some uh, messaging test. They could not do that on their desktop. Th that's definitely not an option. And we cannot give uh, to anyone their own environment to, to do those kind of tests. So now if we go in the details, so there's a lot of details here, you should be able to almost do the same thing that we did if you take that um, topology. So I mentioned that we created virtual networks which are uh, pre-created. So for example, we created 10 networks, 10 virtual networks. Each, uh, so that's a Nova um, network gateway with a virtual switch. OVS um, kernel module. And every time you create a network using Nova Manage, there's a, a gateway that is created on that network. Upstream, we have one interface that goes to the firewall for access to our corporate internet or QA network. And one interface that goes to the blue network, which is where all the, the provider network is, where all the um, the production network is, like an infrastructure uh, network. So when you create a VM, it logically has an interface on the green network. It's tunneled through the virtual switch back to that box. And there's a set of policy-based rules that are directing the traffic coming on those gateways to the orange um, link so that it goes through the firewall directly. They can, and we allow them to talk to each other, but we don't allow traffic to be routed outside of that dotted line here. So what we run on that box is Nova Network, Metadata API, so that uh, Cloud Init could work. Here on every uh, hypervisor, we have the standard um, KVM and um, Nova Compute, plus the OVS switch. The, the route here is, is just basically the, their uh, gateway interface. We have, uh, in terms of infrastructure, we have the scheduler, the APIs, and Quantum. Quantum talks to the Nisera controllers, which is on the same network, and the service nodes. So it's pretty simple uh, if you want. The only trick is that um, because we are using Nova Network and we are not using the HA way of deploying uh, Nova Network, we had to figure out how to make the gateway HA, which means that when, for example, this box dies, the standby gateway can take over the uh, traffic routing for the networks. So what happens is that we have a pair of switches and a pair of uh, firewalls each connected to those two standby, uh, standby and active gateway. And the, the Nova network, when um, it restarts, recreates all the gateways and uh, routes that are required for the traffic to go through the standby gateway. And we fail over this IP here, that is the IP that the switch, that the um, firewall is using to send traffic back to the dev cloud. So it may happen that we lose some traffic. The failover is not instantaneous, so it's not uh, the best solution. But uh, so far, um, we did not have any outage, and um, we did not have to try our HA logic, so <laughs> which is good. Um, in terms of uh, tricks, I can um, talk a bit more about the flow, and you will see uh, how this happens. So we have our cloud portal that is used by the developers. And here you, you request an instance. 
automatically we tag this request with the class of service, the type of OS that you want, and the size. And we have an orchestrator that is going to um, front-end the request. The main reason we have this orchestrator is that we need to configure DNS. And uh, today in Nova, there is no easy way to automatically configure DNS. And um, we are evolving this architecture to be completely based on OpenStack, removing the, the green component here. Uh, but this requires some uh, hacks and uh, hooks that we, we have to put into Nova. So when you have your, your instance, right, uh, at some point you create the VM on the compute. You, you have a phase where you have to get the IP and create the port, so that goes through Quantum. Quantum talks to the Nisera controller, creates the port, the port is attached to the network. Uh, the switch is created by the administrator when you create the network. So you have to map the, um, the switch to the network, which is done uh, through some um, tags in the Nisera controller. Um, at the same time, when you create a network, what happens is that you have to create the gateway. And the way this works is uh, OVS implements a bridge uh, emulation, Linux bridge emulation. So by using just the, simp the same Nova, uh, processes, Nova network processes to create the gateways, the, uh, um, a bridge is created, not a bridge, sorry, um, a gateway interface is created also uh, talking to Nisira and attaching this uh, gateway to the same uh, network, logical switch. So that's the, the basic, basic flow. Um, this can be uh, simplified. Um, there's two elements that I want to point out. One is uh, because we, we pre-created the network and we have a maximum capacity for each network of 256 IPs, we need to uh, assign ourselves the network for each request. We cannot let the tenant choose their network. So what we do is we look up the Nova database, we look at how many ports are already assigned or how many IPs are already assigned in that network, and we select the next network that is available, and we send the, that network information uh, as the, an extension to the boot instance. And um, so we worked, um, someone in the room, uh, Subu, implemented a, a, an extension to the Nova scheduler in order to do that. So we can uh, remove that step uh, from our uh, internal uh, orchestrator. And uh, we also have the, the requirement to create a DNS entry forward and reverse for the created uh, um, VMs. So today uh, we do that through some glue that is listening to IMQP, to uh, RabbitMQ. And there, is a, there was a, a session previously talking about uh, the future of DNS in OpenStack, and eventually uh, this DNS management will be a component provided by OpenStack. So that's the, um, the flow. Now, some people say, you're crazy to use OpenStack, it's not stable. So for us, that's our availability here, for since we opened. Uh, the two deep, I think I, I, I have I am to blame for the two dips because I, I did some operations on our infrastructure without using the right interface and I caused some issues. But otherwise, it's, it's really stable for us. Um, if you look at the, an interesting uh, graph here is the latency to create a VM and it's pretty consistently under 75 seconds. And uh, it includes all the steps that I uh, talked about before. Um, the network connectivity creation and all of that. And our users are pretty happy because I looked this morning, I had to look at the slide every day because that, that's the guy that is happy that, <laughs> that the, we are reaching 800 VMs now. So that's uh, without uh, advertising too much that infrastructure uh, because since we didn't know how it would work, we never really say open for business, but people are finding out that there's an infrastructure where they can get machine for free. So they, they kind of, <laughs> that's, it's, it goes very quick, right? So what we have to find out now is how do we, we reclaim the VMs that are not used? Because since it costs nothing, 
people might have three or three VMs that are running and they are not using them. So we have to, to find a way to do some uh, garbage collection and reclaim the VMs. Otherwise, we are going to put pay too much licenses. So <laughs> Our vendors. So what works and what doesn't work? So the good thing is that uh, if, you, if you are in an enterprise, you, you, the first thing that you realize is that there are processes to change firewall rules and that there's an SLA to change firewall rules that can be between one week, two weeks, depending on the complexity of the change. So one of the benefits of this architecture is that we configure the firewall once per class of service so the firewall has some specific uh, group of policies that is identical in every co-location for every class of, for a given class of service. And we manage which VM goes into which network and therefore which class of service. So the, the um, secu net se network security guys are very happy because they get to define the policies, they get to control every packet that goes through that firewall but they don't get the tickets every time we add a VM. So they were very happy about that. And that's a model that we are going to extend because it's uh, making a lot of sense to focus on the policies and not the um, hard work to create uh, new rules every time you have uh, every uh, change in the infrastructure. So the, the network are pre-created. So that's good for provider networks, but uh, for tenants, we will do that uh, dynamically. We, we can use the same pattern to create different class of service. We, we have the logic now to do that, for example, for the two or three other class of service that we want to implement. The stability, as I said, our stack, uh, uh, Mr. MVP, OpenStack, Ubuntu, KVM, worked very well for us. Uh, we can compare that to something I did not mention, is that already 50% of our infrastructure runs on our own cloud. And uh, we can compare the performance and scalability of our own cloud with what we have developed for the developer class of service. And it compares very favorably. So uh, we, it, for us, it's uh, a proof that we can move to the next phase, which is start deploying production use case on that infrastructure. And there's interesting feature coming up in Folsom and Quantum V2 that we are anxious to use. So that's, that's very good and I think that that area of uh, Nova is where uh, innovation is going to happen. Uh, sorry, the, this area of OpenStack is, I think, where the most innovation is going to happen because I don't want to um, diminish the, the Nova um, capabilities, but there's not much happening in the hypervisor space, right? You, you may uh, add virtual, virtual um, VZ for um, OpenVZ for new hypervisor, LHC, or uh, Hyper-V, but there's not a lot of new features that we can develop there. But I think that on the network side, there's still a lot that can be done, and th that's a very interesting area to, to contribute. The bad thing, um, today, as I mentioned, in um, OpenStack, you cannot do an assignment of network policy-based. So you have to uh, let either the user define what NIC they want to use for their um, uh, VMs, or you use the default policy, which is every public network get attached to the, the VM plus the project-specific network. Um, in SX, there was only one network flavor, and you could only have one gateway. Um, if you use the, the Nova, uh, the Nova get, uh, network the way we are using it. So this has limitations because, for example, for two different class of service, you might want to use two different routers connected to different firewalls. And uh, I think that in uh, Folsom, we will be able to do that. Um, scale out, uh, there's um, still one bottleneck, which is the, the router or the gateway where all the virtual networks are terminating. So today, it, in our design, um, we have uh, one gig link. But since it's mostly interactive traffic, uh, it's SSH connections, it's not a problem. But if we have, uh, for example, uh, use cases that uh, require a lot of data out of their virtual network and th that data resides on the physical network. It has to go through that gateway, like the north-south traffic, and that gateway is going to be a bottleneck, and I know that uh, the Misira team is trying to remove uh, as much as possible this part of the, the topology. Um, the 
one thing that is complex is uh, linked to the, the, the organization uh, and policies that you have in big enterprise, which is usually you want separation of consent between networking security and the server management team. Uh, it's either for compliance uh, point of view or just for plain uh, uh, best practices. So what's happening right now is you see that on that gateway server, we have networking uh, components, we have security components because so we have a virtual switch, we have uh, rules, uh, IP, IP um, uh, rules, we have um, firewall rules, and um, we it's running on a compute server, right? So who is going to manage that infrastructure? Is it the server team? Is it the networking team? Or is it the NetSec team? So that there's interesting challenges with network virtualization where you don't really know now who is managing what. So I think that as we mature, we'll find out the, the right middle ground. But most of the time, the networking team will say, oh, if it's not uh, wrapped in a sheet metal, I don't want to manage it. NetSec will say, oh, it's not a firewall that I support, so you are on your own. And the server guys will say, oh, well, there's too many things on that uh, box that I don't understand that I don't want to manage because it's networking, it's security, and all of that, right? So, uh, it, and it's understandable because now you have to have uh, people that understand the, the three technologies. So it's um, kind of the, the challenge that we have. So what's next? Um, so we are going to implement different class of service, additional one, more like production-like. Um, one thing that we looked at is uh, for production tra traffic, we likely go to another model, which is bridge network to avoid the overhead. But since there's less and less overhead now with um, tunneling, uh, it might not be even relevant. Uh, we have um, a bit more than 80 machines. I don't know exactly how many machines we have today that are supporting the 800 VMs, but we are going to increase uh, this infrastructure to as much as possible. I cannot tell the number because it depends on how many developers we have. Um, more gateways, so we are going to move the gateways to 10 gig links so that we can have uh, more north-south bandwidth available outside of the, um, the virtual networks. Uh, we are going to uh, in integrate with uh, Folsom and look at uh, also um, integrating with uh, some work that happens uh, in the load balancing space and uh, plug load balancers in that network so that we can have traffic coming from the internet w through like a one arm type of load balancer setup going on the virtual network through some floating IP to serve some uh, uh, typical uh, front end use case. And uh, we are working on a cleaner uh, OpenStack integration, which is what I mentioned before that Subu and team are working on, which is the uh, moving all the parts that we had in our own uh, custom cloud implementation to uh, be in the OpenStack proper um, domain. And uh, at the same time, contributing back as much as we can or on to um, the OpenStack community to what we are doing in that space. And last but not least, we are I, we are hiring too, right? <laughs> like <laughs> this morning, there was a, a question by Thierry. I think uh, how many people are hiring <laughs> OpenStack developers, and I think that everybody is. So, but um, at, at least we are a, a bit different than the other ones. Any question? Yes. Yes, I, I did look at it. Um, the, to be honest, the hypervisor choice, the um, controller choice um, was based on maturity. So I'm sure that in a few months or few years, there will be more options. Uh, right now, uh, I'm not paid by Nisira, I guarantee you, but they are the most mature solution. Um, and uh, it, it's been proven so far, right? Uh, I'm not saying that you cannot make Ryu or Midokura or other solutions work, I'm sure, but uh, with the, our scale requirements and um, our availability and reliability requirements, we felt more comfortable at this point with Nisera.
So today, it's only internal facing, but the next phase that will be delivered in December is external facing too. Same infrastructure. And uh, the difference will be that each network, each tenant network will be its own virtual network because we have stronger um, isolation requirement. Because like if one uh, tenant gets uh, um, um, compromised, we don't want the, the other tenants to be compromised. So th there we will use uh, private networks and we will control the traffic that goes in and out of each tenant network. No VLAN segmentation, all, all virtual network. VLANs, like our network team said, no VLANs. There, there's, there are too many issues with VLANs. There is, yes, network segmentation, yes. Yes? Yes, they could. It's still compatible with security groups. The only thing is that they would not be able to grant themselves access to something that the perimeter firewall disabled, right? So, and that's, uh, that's also something that uh, is important is when I mentioned that security groups cannot really be combined together with provider rules, is that if you give access to security groups and people can change any rules they want, then th th you have to make sure that they cannot disable some provider specific rules. And that's where having this separation is very interesting for us. Exactly, so there's provider security, which is defined for each class of service, and then there's pertinent security. And if you wa don't want to expose your um, service, for example, your database outside of your virtual network, you, you have two options. You don't put a floating IP, so no one can reach in, or you, you put a floating IP and you select which host can access your database, for example. Yes? Oh, uh, I, let me go back because I think uh, it's, uh, it's maybe um, I I important. So the, no, let me go back one more. So there is, um, okay, let's take this example. Each v VM is uh, in the, the top of the rack environment, which is like the, the leaf and spine environment, but the gateways, they are not connected in that uh, leaf and spine environment. They are connected directly to uh, our core or distribution fabric because it's north, south traffic so there's no point of putting, like for example, the gateway here and going all the way back to a firewall, right? So the, the, our infrastructure is connected uh, differently than our compute nodes. And the other reason is because the connection between the, the firewall and the gateway is using VLANs. So that's the only place where we have VLANs is that here, uh, I did not mention that, but the orange link here is a VLAN. So those two are two VLANs, right? And the VLAN span is really between those four, uh, six elements. It doesn't go out. And that's uh, the maximum that we want to do with VLANs. It's just like local VLANs if you want. So if we spin out another uh, colocation uh, or another instance of that, we can even reuse the same VLANs because those things will not be connected to some trunks, right? So we limit the layer to um, span. So Nova network, so you, the question is, how do we create the, the, the gateway here? So the Nova network through no, Nova manage, when you create a network, automatically Nova network creates that gateway for you. And it happens that because of the bridge compatibility, it's using the same uh, Linux bridge command to, to do that, DRCTL. And the, uh, under the cover, this results in the creation of a Nisira port attached to your network. Yes? Okay. 
So the question is how many machines and what are the, the upgrade challenges? So today we have uh, 80 machines. So it's like 10 VM per machines. I think we can go to 12 uh, with our current configuration. I don't know if we can go much higher. Um, the upgrade challenge that we are seeing is first, um, the open V switch is a, a kernel module. And when you upgrade a kernel module, you have to be careful not to bring down your VMs and have to reboot, right? So the upgrade of that component here is a, a critical part and you have to get it right. Um, the, the upgrade pass for the rest of the components is similar to any kind of uh, uh, OpenStack upgrade. Um, I guess you take a backup of your database and you hope that the upgrade uh, scripts is going to do the right thing. But um, I don't think that there's uh, any more challenges. Like we, we upgraded our infrastructure from Diablo to SX and uh, multiple release of SX up to the, the actual uh, release. Uh, and um, it went pretty smoothly. I, I don't think that there was any specific issue because uh, the, the Nisera infrastructure is pretty agnostic to what happens on the OpenStack uh, side. The only issue is, is the OpenStack components. And uh, so far, it's been pretty easy to upgrade. I, I cross my finger and hope next time is going to be as good, but. Any other question? Okay, thanks.